Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. Hey. Hey. How are you? I'm doing swell. Swell? Yeah. Swell is a good word. Super, like an old super word. good. It's like a 50s word. Yeah. Like, golly gee, I'm feeling swell. Yeah. <laughs> my, my football coach used to, in high school, used to say, oh, Phil sticks. Fiddle sticks? Yeah, he would never swear, but he would say, when he was really mad, he would throw his clipboard on the ground and say, oh, Phil sticks. Really? I had a friend who said fudge. Fudge, yeah. Like, oh, fudge. And I was like, what? See, we're already off topic and we haven't even started. I don't even know what the topic is. I wanted to think about outlining and thinking about how people can build a... Uh, what would I say? Like build a way to practice things at a level that they're comfortable with. Like we, beginning practice. Like beginning practice. Yes. Um, I think sometimes we forget there are people who haven't even started and they're just trying to get started. And I want to speak to those people, okay. having been one of those people many, many years ago. Yep. I think, first of all, you've alluded to or specifically talked about why we need to practice. Yeah. And we should probably mention what we're practicing. We're practicing thinking and thinking. why. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you know, I think most people think of thinking as something that just happens. Yeah. It does, and it happens poorly, you know, and it happens with a lot of bias and a lot of uh, mistakes and things like that. So yeah. practicing one's thinking or more accurately practicing one's what's called metacognition. So thinking in thinking is a common word for what's called cognition right. in science. And then metacognition is is thinking about thinking. So that yes. this, those are just big words for thinking. And then thinking about thinking or being aware is a, yeah. is more. It's not even that you're thinking about your thinking per se. It's that you're you're being aware of the way that you're thinking. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. I remember way back in the day when I was just starting to learn all of these things and we were starting to work together. It is definitely pulling subconscious into the conscious with purpose, mm -hmm. like actually, and you, it's almost like training wheels, forcing yourself to say, oh, wait, I need to ask myself, what is, how am I thinking about this thing? Am I making a relationship that's not there? You know, am I taking a weird perspective? Am I biased? Totally. That kind of thing. Yeah, and I think it's really important to, to for people to understand that when when we say thinking, uh, th there are some folks who I, I've heard talk about thinking and they they propose or or allude to the idea that thinking is what's happening consciously and and then some other thing is happening unconsciously. And I think that's a terrible distinction because we're already making a distinction between conscious and unconscious. So the distinction's there. They're different because one's conscious and one's unconscious. Right. But the process that you're using is the same. Yes. So if you understand how you're processing in your conscious thinking, mm -hmm. then you understand how you're processing in your unconscious thinking, and you can bring more of what's unconscious to the surface. Yeah. So I wouldn't think of thinking as simply what is what you're aware of. Because most of us go through life, we're not, we're not aware of our thinking at all. Um, so... What we want to do is understand thinking, the processes that are happening when, we, when we're thinking. Mm -hmm. And then as a result of understanding those processes, we can kind of let more of our unconscious stuff come to the surface. And that's where our bias is and that's where our mistakes and thinking errors are and all the costly things that we do. Yeah. I mean, I think when you say the conscious versus unconscious thing, I remind myself so, for example, if I'm having a conversation and there's a moment where I'm like, oh, I just realized, I'm sorry, I was thinking of it this way. Or, mm -hmm. oh, I was taking this perspective, but I wasn't aware of it at the time that I was talking to you about, which that's the subconscious stuff that's yes. creeping into the interaction that I wasn't aware of at the time. Right. How many times, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Yeah. And And just how many times do we say, oh, my bad, I wasn't thinking of it that way or... You know. Well, in hindsight, being 2020 is a great example of why metacognition has been shown scientifically to be so powerful. Like one of the most powerful things you can do for human performance, human change, you know, decreasing bias, de decreasing thinking errors, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
metacognition, the reason we have hindsight is 2020 is because we have a little bit of medical, you go, oh, I see. Like at the, at the time I was thinking this way, but now I see that I should have been thinking this way. So it's, it's literally hindsight being 2020, aside from possibly new information, it's also the awareness that comes with looking back because mm -hmm. you're looking back at the situation and that's a form of metacognition. Well, the truth is we can have that metacognition in the moment if we practice. Yes. And that's why practice is so important. The only other thing I wanted to add, because it just made me think about when you're talking about is you have that moment where you're actually having a, an emotional reaction to something and you don't know why. Mm. To me, that's part of the the unconscious piece where in your subconscious is making relationship. 100%. Something maybe in your past or something that's bothered you before to something that happens in the present. Even they're totally, they're totally unrelated in reality. Mm -hmm. But my subconscious is sort of making a connection. It brings up emotions that I'm not quite aware of. And I, why am I feeling this way about, you know, in this situation? Yeah, it's, that, it's so critically important, one, to dispel this myth that people have, which is thinking is analytical and it doesn't include emotional intelligence and all that. Metacognition drives emotional intelligence. Like emotional intelligence is almost entirely metacognition. Right. In fact, meta-analyses, and there's a lot of meta in there, but meta-analyses, which are kind of the gold standard of, of um, science because it's taking lots of different studies and putting them together and seeing what they all are saying sort of as a collective. Yeah. Um, Meta-analytic studies on metacognition, <laughs> sort of uh, meta too much meta, show that if you want to develop emotional intelligence, you'd be better off teaching metacognition than teaching directly to emotional intelligence, which is like a mind-blowing uh, right. Right. fact. Meaning awareness of how you're thinking about things is the root of yes. being able to respond in a moment with emotional mm -hmm intelligence, awareness, pro-social stuff. Yeah. And the, and the reason that's so critically important is especially with emotion. Like you said, sometimes an emotion will just appear out of nowhere. Yeah. You don't even know why you're feeling it. Well, that's because the thought that preceded the emotion, the thinking that the, the mental model that caused the emotion to come into play mm -hmm. was subconscious. Right. Right. So you thought something subconsciously mm -hmm. that spurred on an emotion. And now that emotion is showing up in your conscious life. Right? In a moment that isn't necessarily a connected moment, to that yeah, emotion. In a, in a moment that might not be a good moment to have that or, you know, whatever. You might not be related to the situation that you're in. It might have just reminded your thought process of something and then that spurs this emotion. Or it could be related. Somebody yeah. could be saying something or doing something that that is bringing right. up emotion. But the only way to figure that out is to be aware of it and think is it to through. to be able to see that, that uh, thought yeah. that happened. And with practice, that's the key. With practice, that thought can become brought immediately out of your subconscious mm -hmm. and into your conscious. So you can go, oh, yeah, like I'm totally reacting right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm full-blown reacting right now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause. You know, take, I'm going to take a breath. Yeah, before, um, before I Before I send that email. <laughs> you know, <laughs> before, <laughs> this is right, before I yeah. have that snappy, snippy retort, uh, before I, mean, I press send on the email, before I... We're not whatever. speaking from personal no. experience. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's start at the beginning then. You said, okay, we're talking about practice. We need to practice, practice. Where do we... Let's start at the very beginning of basically where somebody would need to start. One, what are we practicing? We're practicing thinking. We're practicing trying to be more aware of our thinking, which is metacognition. Mm -hmm. Thinking is both subconscious and conscious, mm -hmm. right? So we're really trying to bring more of our subconscious to the surface. Uh, why do we want to do that? Because it's going, you know, thinking drives all, all human change, all human performance in any realm metacognition will increase our success in any realm, personal or professional. You'll be better at whatever it is you're trying to do, whether that thing is physical, whether it's conceptual, 
whether it's emotional, emotional, whether it's, you know, logistical, mm -hmm. family, personal life, professional life, it doesn't matter whether you're organizing a team. I'm always kind of interested in when I hear Arnold Schwarzenegger talk about his when he was, you know, Mr. Yeah. Universe. Uh, yeah. And um, when he when he was figuring that out as a young man, you know, this is like weightlifting and bodybuilding, literally body sculpting was what he was doing. He was a deep thinker about that. And if you listen to what he's saying and what he was inventing, right? you know, now we know all this stuff. But when you listen to what he was inventing for the first time, he was an innovator in that space. He was talking about when you're doing a curl, focus your thought on the muscle. Right. Focus your thought on the muscle and be aware of your form and, you know, the range and all blah, blah, blah. Right. So it might not be completely obvious to people how, well, how, how is thinking part of working out? Mm hmm well, the way you work out is determined by the mental model you have of what is the right way to work out. Yes, that's right. So if you're working out in ways that are ineffective, in ways that are, you know, uh, n not functional. Demotivating. Demotivating, you know. You got to change the way you think. You got to change the way you think to change the way you work out. The reason Arnold was so remarkable at sculpting one's body and showed us, you know, the the possibilities of, of this kind of world yeah. is because he was thinking deeply about these kinds of things and then changing his practice based on changing his thoughts. Right. Things change when thinking changes. Universally. Universally so. says, yes. right? No matter what it is. So if you want something to change, you have to change your thinking. Yes. So the only time that this is not necessary is if you're totally cool. Oh, meaning you don't need yeah, to change. If you don't anything, want anything I, to change about your life, yeah. you don't need to change your thing. You're good. Everything's good. Well, unless you just want to like get good at yeah, but even that's change, right? So if if there's anything about your life, personal, professional, or otherwise, about yourself that you want to change for whatever reason that you want to change it, the the starting point of that change is changing your thinking. Because that mental model will cascade into behavior, beliefs, yeah. you know, emotion, action. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because a lot of people, when they're starting to try to change something, they'll focus on changing the context or changing the variables to the problem. Mm -hmm. They're not realizing that, that they have to go back a step further and think about what was the mental model that got me here? How was I thinking about it when I got into this situation? And, That's right. And go back and sort of interrogate the mental model and change the way they were thinking about it to actually have the change in the yeah and what, and what does stuff. what does changing the context mean it means it means first you have to have the thought that the context is somehow influencing yes second you have to have the thought that there's there's a difference between possibly you know a negatively influencing context and a positively and so you're making a distinction between those things and those are systems made up of parts mm -hmm. right and then, and then you have to say, oh, okay, now I have to move from, I have to change my, my surroundings from this kind of surrounding to this kind of surrounding. So, right? Yeah. And that starts at when I go shopping at the grocery store or when, you know, I, I choose things not to bring things into the house. It starts with changing my friends, you know, who want to party all the time or whatever, right? It starts with, right, the way that you come up with the action plan is to think differently about what the problem is. Yes. So thinking is driving that action plan. That's right. Otherwise, you wouldn't know what to do if you didn't yeah. think about it. Then there would just you'd just be it'd be like tumbleweeds. You'd just be like, <laughs> how do we like? How does a person know what that means? Thinking. Well, yeah, that's the the, the classic story was uh, we were. I mean, you'll remember this. Yeah. But many many years ago, uh, we were in, doing a case study in a classroom. I forget what grade that fifth was. Grade. Fifth grade. It's fifth grade. And I see you know the story right away because we've told it so many times. Um, this the teacher was saying, I, you know, show me your thinking. T tell me about your thinking. Really think emphasize. It. Think yeah. about it. Think about it. 
And the little girl came up to her and said, you know, Mrs. Uh, Smith, you keep saying, you know, think about it. Just think about it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what you mean by that. What is thinking? Yeah. And it's an absolutely brilliant question. What yeah. is thinking? Yeah. Uh, it's a question that we, that our research has spent, all of our 30 years of research has spent sim- simply answering that question. Well, what I would is- say, and that was a pivotal moment for us. Because yeah. that was early on. And we're like, oh, wow, we should probably start at the beginning. Yeah. Like, what does it mean what does to it mean? think about something, to think something through? So what we know 30 years later is thinking is we distinguish between this and that. And we're doing that constantly every day, every minute, every second of every day, we're distinguishing between this and that. You know, even to take a footstep, we're distinguishing between, you know, a, an unstable landscape and a stable landscape, yes. like a floor versus rocks or whatever. I mean, we're, we're distinguishing with our tongue, we're distinguishing with our ears, we're distinguishing with our eyes, and we're distinguishing concepts with our brain. Yes. So we're, we're constantly making distinctions between identity and other. So that's the D in DSRP. Mm-hmm. We're breaking things down into parts and grouping them. So we're yes. breaking stuff and we're grouping stuff. Right. That's part whole systems. Breaking it down and integrating it up. Yeah. Yep. So that's the S in, in DSRP. Mm-hmm. We're constantly relating cause and effect or, or action and reaction. Like something happens and then something changes as a result of that action. And that we call that relationships. So we're constantly relating things. Well, we're looking for connections between Looking for connections, stuff. yep. And we're doing all that from, from our or from different perspectives. Mm-hmm. And when we change the perspective, we change the frame. We change the things in the frame, right? Just like when a, a, yeah. you know, a director goes like this. Mm-hmm. When he changes the frame, he changes what's in the frame. He changes how things interrelate in the frame, what's seen, what's not seen, right? The distinctions, all that kind of stuff. So when we answer the question, what is thinking? When we answer that little girl's question, Mm -hmm. the answer is thinking is the process of organizing information to make meaning. Yes. Or mental models. Mental models and meaning are the same thing. Right. So we take information. We organize it in DSRP ways. Meaning we distinguish it, we relate it, we group it, yep. we look at it from different perspectives. Yep. And that In a very is... dynamic process. DSRP is yep. very dynamic, so it's not this and then this and then this. We did no, yeah, sorry. Episode on buckets. But, you know, so we take information out in the world, we organize it in a particular way, and out of that we get meaning or mental models. Right. And that process is called thinking. Mm-hmm. That's yes. what thinking is. So at the very basic level, the first thing to do when we say practice is just realize that there are that you are organizing information to make meaning. That's right. That just be aware of that. Yeah. So when you practice, one of the things you can do is create what we call a patterns, questions, moves table. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. So if we just make a simple table. Patterns, questions, moves. What we're going to do over here is we just talked about the patterns, yes. right? So the patterns are distinctions, and distinctions are made up of identity and other. Meaning one thing and another thing. Yeah. So it's those are, these are called the elements. So we could think of this as patterns and elements. Yep. And then systems is made up of, this is the D and this is the S, is made up of part interacting with whole. So those are the elements of S. And then relationships is made up of action interrelating with reaction. And perspective Mm -hmm. is, this is my, like a physician writing or something like that. I know, it's good. It's terrible writing, but uh, point and view. And that just means like the observer and the observed, right? Yeah. Some people get confused by the word point and view. But if you think about it, a point of view is a perspective, and it requires a point, a looker, and a view, a looked at, or an observer and the observed. Right. Right? Right. So the first thing to practice, because we need the language of thinking to help us facilitate the understanding of thinking. So we need words for some of the things that are happening. Just like if you went and you started baseball for the first time, you would need to know some new words. You'd need to know what a glove is. You'd need to know what a 
baseball diamond is. You need to know what a bat is. You yes. need to know what a helmet is and the ball and, the, you know, first base, second base. So yeah. All this new language would have to happen. So yeah. the first thing you have to practice just so you can have a facility with thinking is these terms. Like practice, memorize these terms and yeah. practice remembering you know, okay, DSRP, I can remember that. DSRP, DSRP, DSRP. Okay, that helps me remember that there's four things. One is distinctions, one is systems, one is relationships, one is perspectives. Mm -hmm. And then you then you ask yourself, well, what are those things? Yeah. Oh, well, distinctions is when we distinguish between an identity and an other, between this and that, between yeah. us and them, between mug and table, you know, or or glass and table. Or glass and mug. Okay. Systems. Well, what do we mean by that? Oh, systems is the relationship between part and whole. Right. Right. And mm -hmm. it's saying that every every whole has parts and every part can be a whole that has parts. Yeah. So let's say that again. Every a little every whole. Yeah. Everything has, has parts. And every whole can be part of a larger whole. Right. And every part can have some parts inside of it. So you're saying a cross scale. Yeah. So we think in this way. So you might say, I think that, you know, government is made up of X, Y, and Z. And I go, yeah, but, but X is also made up of PDQ. Yes. So government's made up of X, Y, Z, and PDQ, right? Right. So we can think that. We yes. can think those thoughts. Then we get to relationships. We remember R in DSRP, and so we remember relationships. And we ask ourselves, well, what do we mean by relationships? Oh, we mean some action, something is acting upon some other thing, mm -hmm. and that other thing is reacting to that action. Yes, meaning something has led to something else. Something has led to something else. And you else. want to yeah. decide what, which is which. Yep, yeah, exactly. And then perspectives is that something is looking at some other thing. Yes. And that thing could be anything, right? You could have perspectives like stakeholders or is a very common yes. perspective. And that's typically humans or roles like mm -hmm. a veterinarian or is looking at the dog or a, you know, uh, the HR representative is looking at HR issues oh, or yeah. some conflict or whatever. Um, so those are stakeholder people kind of points of views, but you can also obviously, you know, Anything with eyes could have points of views, like yeah. frogs and elk, you, and I always yeah. use those. Um, <laughs> but also, um, you can have conceptual perspectives or analytical perspectives, like, you know, you could look at something from the perspective of cost or from the perspective of uh, sustainability, sustainability, or equity, or equity, you know, whatever. We had a friend once, I think, uh, who looked at what was it, war from the perspective of. Weather? Yeah, exactly. Something like that. And it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, you could study how you wars and how that weather impacts war. Exactly. So the first step in your practice is in your table, just write these down. Just write them down. And if you, I mean, we just spent five minutes talking about this, but you could probably write this in, in you know, 30 seconds yeah. or something like that. And it's just 12 terms, D distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives. So four patterns. Four patterns. And then... Eight elements, which mm -hmm. is identity, other, part, whole, action, reaction, point, view. And the elements are the things that make up the patterns. Yeah. So, so if you want to define what, what these things are, you have to understand the elements. Yes. Yeah. You have to know what they are. Yep. That's driving all of thinking. So the very first part is just realizing that we're organizing information using these four things mm -hmm. uh, to make meaning, to build a mental model, and then... Once you've got that, then you're like, okay, well, what does it mean to actually distinguish something? Mm -hmm. What am I calling the idea? What am I seeing as the thing? And what is something that's not the thing? So yeah. yeah. So then you get to this next column, which we call questions or thinkquery is a funny name that we came up with. Yes. Which just means to think and and also ask, you know, to query. Yes. Um, and this becomes very important in this new age where prompting yes. AI is so important. It's all about asking better questions. Really, yes. intelligence is about asking better questions because oftentimes there are multiple answers to any any issue. So your ability to ask questions mm -hmm. is actually deeply uh, a part of your what we what we call smart or intelligent. It's funny you say that. I was talking to an educator yesterday, mm -hmm. and I and I, we were just talking about 
strengths and weaknesses of current practice. And he said, you know, we, we have spent too much time focusing on the answers, and now we need to develop skills of questioning. How do we question to get better knowledge, deeper yeah, understanding? Yeah, that's very astute. If you, you know, one thing that people are always doing with the Turing test and things like that, um, and, and that's coming up a lot with AGI or, uh, uh, you know, artificial general intelligence um, or AI, um, is, is, you know, what, what is this, what's the difference between artificial intelligence and human intelligence? What's the, what, what defines intelligence? And to me, what I think is really interesting is when we try to train people at the high level, one of the things we, you know, the highest level of science, one of the things you try to train them in is, is having a little humility about what they know and don't know. Yes. And being able to say, I don't know, is a deeply scientific thing. Being able to say, I, you know what, we don't know a lot. There's a lot of things we don't know the answers to. There's some things that we know, yeah. you know, th through experimentation and the s s science and all that kind of stuff. But there's a lot that we don't know. Yeah. And one thing that's really interesting that I think really distinguishes between human intelligence and artificial intelligence, yeah. you'll never have an artificial intelligence engine say, I don't know. Interesting, meaning it always has. It'll meaning. never answer that. It always has an answer. Yeah. Because we've trained it that it should just have an answer. Any answer. It always has an yeah. answer. Interesting. And if it doesn't have an answer, some people have noticed it just makes one up. It's like a, a you know, like a, a freshman college student. Like they just <laughs> make, they make shit up, right? So, so questions are so much more important than answers, first of all. Yeah. And that's why we have a, a question column in our practice table. All right. So we're going to take each one of these and, and turn it into a question. Bingo. Ask. Bingo. So the, all we're going to do is, is take these, you know, uh, columns. And so what are the questions for distinctions if we convert this very deep construct of identity other distinctions to a very simple question it's what is blank meaning whatever you're thinking about and a sub question would be what it, what is not blank right mm -hmm. so what is and is not blank that's the that's a very powerful question yes so if somebody said hey i've got a job for you to do. I need it really quick. What's the first thing you got to know? What is it? What, what is it and what is it not? Yes, but I don't think we're always aware of the what is it not piece. Completely. I think that's sort of subconscious. We're trying to make a boundary. So yeah. we think we're asking what it is, but we're actually deciding what it is based on both of these. And that's really important because if you think about the most important things in your life, like who are you? Who? What kind of job do you want? What kind of person do you want to spend your life with? A good portion of your life is spent finding out what you don't want to do, yeah. who you're not, and who you don't want to be with. Yeah. Right? So, <laughs> you, you know, we often find out what the thing is not before, before we kind of zero in on what the thing is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the same happens in science all the time when we're trying to get construct validity or, or zoom in on what, what is this thing. We, we go, well, we, we definitely know it's not that. Yes. We still don't fully know what it is yet, but we're as we eliminate possibilities, we kind of zoom in or zero in on on what it is. So it turns out that understanding the other or what it's not is is almost more important than understanding what it is because what it's not gets us to what it is. Because when you ask this question, you actually you find the boundary yeah. of the is. That's right. right? You, you, you know the line between and that's, something is and isn't. And that's so important because most a lot of folks make the mistake of thinking a distinction is a thing. Yeah. Right? But when you're making a distinction, you're actually drawing a boundary between two things, between identity and other or not identity. Right. Right? And some of that's subconscious, a lot of that's subconscious because you're just, you usually just conscious of the identity that you're making, but you're totally unconscious of the boundary that you're drawing yeah. and and uh, the externalities that you're creating in the yes. system that are outside the boundary, which are called other, all that kind of stuff. This episode is sponsored by Training Camp. 
the ultimate online spot for building the mental fitness that drives personal and professional change and success. At Training Camp, you'll have access to the science and practice of thinking with personalized thinking assessments, tiered training, and best of all, practice that improves skill. Go to cabrerlab.org to learn more. And now, back to the episode. So understanding this, quite, this is a very simple question, what is and what is not blank, right? Kind of like Mad Libs, old Mad Libs with the blanks. Then the question for S, systems, systems right? Part whole. The part whole is, what are the parts of blank? And what is blank a part of? And those get to what we were talking about earlier here, which is seeing a thing across levels of scale. So you see it as a part of a larger whole, but you also see it as a thing that also has parts. Yep. So you're understanding it more deeply because you're seeing it up and down. That's right. Simple question, but again, our research shows our research shows that people very rarely ask uh, this second question. Yeah. And that, that that actually lots of executives and people that are trying to bring up middle managers into executive picture uh, executive positions. Yeah. They're interested in them having this skill. They call it enterprise thinking in business. Yeah. Which just means that you're thinking at the enterprise level, at the that the yeah. whole business yeah. level rather than like a division level or something like that. But all that all that means is I'm thinking several levels up. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking several levels up from where the task is or where the project is or where the division is. Yep. I'm thinking a couple levels up yep. about how these things connect up above me. Seeing the bigger picture. Yeah. Right. And it is it is very obvious to me in many contexts that we're really good at breaking stuff down, breaking stuff down, breaking stuff, making lists, hierarchies, breaking stuff down. And we don't, off, like you said, don't often go the other direction in our thinking so that yeah i would say we're much better at breaking stuff down than than building stuff up than than going up i just think it's a bad habit it's a well, bad habit you know. yeah yeah anyway all right then we get to relationships and there's two questions there which is uh, are are the how are the parts how are the parts connected mm -hmm. and there's kind of a question of or not right. how are they not connected or related. And then the second question is, how is blank related to blank? Right. Meaning you're trying to figure out the relationship between two things. Yep. Yeah. Because this question, what this question is saying is, well, how are, how are or are not the things related? Mm -hmm. And then we can take any one of those relationships and zoom into them and say, well, okay, well, how exactly are these two related? How are these two related? How are these two over here related? Right. right? So it's almost building off of what are the parts of blank and then how are those parts yeah, connected? Exactly. Uh, because we don't often ask ourselves, we are good at listing the parts, but we don't That's actually right. connect them and relate them. And then for perspectives, the question is pretty simple. It's what what are what are some points of points view? Of view that we can or should uh, look at blank. Blank. Questioning the way we're looking at something and seeing if there are other ways to look at That's it. That's right. From other points to look at it. That's right. Again, it, it, we've taken quite a bit of time to go through this, mm -hmm. but this can be practiced. This whole thing that we've shown you so far could be done in three minutes. Well, you mean in terms of writing it down? In terms of daily practice. We yes. call these warm-ups. We call these warm-ups. It's, it's like literally you go into the gym and you, you kind of do some stretching. You kind of get ready for the workout. This, and, and, and sometimes when you first start at the gym, the warm-up is the workout. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. So these are warm-ups. You know, if you, can, if you can do this and spend just a few minutes every day just getting this down to the point where you can do it kind of like backwards and forwards. Yeah. Then you then the warm up isn't exhausting anymore. Yeah, but yes, and let me speak to my own experience with this stuff many many years ago. I took a little not too long, a little bit of time for me to just understand to to think about how I was organizing information and to remember I'm making distinctions, I'm organizing things into systems, I'm relating things, I'm taking perspectives. Then the next step was 
oh, well, let me really think about what does it mean that I'm making a distinction? And then I start thinking about identity and other and, you know, what is the thing and not the thing? And then I'd start thinking about, you know, parts and whole. So I started thinking at the sort of elemental level. Mm -hmm. And that took a little bit of just uh, conscious practice to bring it into my awareness. But that didn't, once that was done, I lived in the questions for a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. The questions are very helpful. Very powerful. Because A, they're English, they're easy to remember. And because you have these blanks, it reminds you, I can ask these questions, any any of them or any combination of them, not all of them. In a situation, I might be thinking, oh, well, what is the relationship I'm making between what you said and what I said? And, you know, or they, they come in handy in the moment mm -hmm. a lot. Yep. Right. Or I'm in a meeting and I'm getting an assignment, like you're saying, from my boss, even though I'm my own boss now. But when I had a boss, you know, and they're giving me, a, I'm like, well, wait a minute. Does it include this or does it not? Well, that's, it's just not. Like, what is the boundary of what is expected of me? Mm -hmm. Right. So I would say these are very practical. Very practical. And they're easy. They're easy to implement to every situation as they apply. Yes. Right. So I don't want to make clear, you don't have to go through all of these questions in every single situation of your life. No. But if you're sitting in a moment and you're trying to understand what something is and isn't, you know that this is the question. Yeah. If I'm trying to figure out your perspective versus my perspective on something, I know that I need to be asking this question. Yeah. If, if people are arguing about a particular thing, you know, that's two different perspectives arguing over a distinction usually. Yes. You know, it's arguing over a distinction. Yes. You know, I, I see it this way. Well, I see it this way. Well, I see it this way. And then, and you're like, well, okay, so you're just making different distinctions. Like, that's right. You're seeing it from a different point of view and you're making different distinctions. Maybe you're including mm -hmm. one person's including, you know, s some parts and another person is including different parts in their, in their, you know, worldview. And, um, yeah. okay, that's not terribly confusing when you look at it that way. It's not, right. I have different parts than you have. And I have yeah. different, I make different, I draw the line in a different place, the boundary in a different place than you draw the boundary. Right. But that also means the conversation moves to what is your mental model yeah. versus what is my mental model? Not you're right and I'm wrong, or I should have said you're wrong and I'm right. Right. If I wanted to be more accurate. Which is why that, you know, the was he? <laughs> Shouldn't. You missed it. I did miss that one. You're right and I'm wrong. And I was like, no, actually, it's you're wrong and I'm right. But yes. I was joking because we don't actually have that problem. So that's why it's so important that we kind of keep in mind that M equals I-O, meaning or mental models is equal to information and organization, right? Mm -hmm. And and the organization, the information is everywhere. Yes. It's, it could be different for every situation. But the organization is D S R N P. This is the way we're organizing yes. information to make meaning. Yes. So if meaning, the meaning we're making is the thing that we're using to, to decide what action to take, to yes. decide what to feel, to decide what to do, to decide how to react. Yes. The way we're organizing that information is absolutely critical to creating that meaning. Yes. And that meaning is driving all of your actions, all of your change efforts, all of your behaviors, all of your beliefs, all of your mental models, everything. Yeah. Meaning or mental models are equal to information and organization, how we organize information. Yeah. And the DSRNP is answering the question, well, wh how do we organize information? Well, we, we make distinctions, we organize it in the part whole, we see relationships, and we take perspectives. In the nonlinear order, in a, yeah, in, in a very dynamical way, because your brain's super dynamical. Yeah. It's not, it's not following like. So sometimes you're thinking you're, it's a relationship that's you're organizing information to relationship to understand it, and you know. Okay, so all I was trying to do is you might spend a little bit of time here in terms of applying this Absolutely. into your daily life. I I remember spending a bit of time in just at, at asking myself these questions as situations. You know, present it. Yeah. Again, going back to the the javelin example that we use a lot is is that, you know, if you go out right now and practice javelin for five minutes, throwing the javelin, you're going to be better at throwing the javelin than eighty percent of the world's population. I mean, this, that's mind blowing if you think about. It. I spent five minutes and I'm all of a sudden better at throwing this stick than most eighty percent of the world's population. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the what what the it's very important to understand that these aren't just any old questions and these aren't just any old patterns. These are the patterns that are going to immediately make you better than 80 85 percent just a little bit of practice is going to make you a better thinker than most of the population and yeah. that's what our, our research has shown and and you know so that's pretty important well and also i would say what's remarkable about that is when you incorporate this for yourself there is a moment where you realize that you understand things better differently and better. And you also see, I, I guess I want to say economies of sale, scale, where once you get really good at one or more of these things, it happens everywhere sort of naturally. And then you realize you're, fa you're thinking in your your own opinion is you're, you're faster, you're getting things more accurate. Yeah. Not, I have less understand misunderstandings, fewer conflicts in conversation. And once that happens, then I started to realize over time I'd be sitting at a table in a meeting, and I was not nervous about speaking. I felt like I understood things, and then people started listening to me more. Yeah. And so it's it's a nice trajectory. You have more clarity of Much thought, more clarity. faster, and more clarity of yes. thought, uh, more awareness of what's driving your emotions, which leads to less conflict and yes, yes, silliness and well, things like it. that. So you'll see it, you'll feel it for yourself, and then you'll see it, and other people will see it eventually. So the, the next thing we're going to talk about is moves, but I do want to make one point about these columns is a lot of people think, oh, wow, that is, there's all these things I got to know. They, there's four patterns. This is the question version of those patterns. Yes. Right? And then we're going to talk about the cognitive moves of those patterns, right? So this is just different ways of seeing the same thing. There, yes. there are four patterns. And if, you want, if you're like more of a linguistic person and you like questions like you, yeah. Uh, for me, I'm much more visual, so I, I like the moves. We're going to show you some of those. But the but if you if you like words and you like questions and things like that, then then this is the question version, the beginner question version of these patterns. Choose the column that suits you. Yeah, exactly. You know, whatever works, it's the workout that works, right? Yeah, <laughs> Andy Galpin says that. He's he's a sharp guy. He he says. Uh, yeah, I always ask him because he knows so much about, you know, um, physiology and workouts and all this kind of stuff, high performance. And they ask him, you know, what's the best, like, workout, you know, blah, 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 should I do this split or that split or what? And he always says, uh, you know, the, the best workout is the one you'll do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, so the best warm-up, the best workout uh, for mental fitness is the one you'll do, whatever – like floats your boat, whatever suits gets you style. excited, whatever suits your style, grab that and 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 work it out, and you will start to notice some some real um, difference. Difference. So here's the visual version, is what. You're yeah. Saying. So the moves are kind of they're just like uh, physical moves, except they're mental moves. They're they're cognitive moves, and they're thing. They're literally like you start at one point and you can go to another point, and this is the move. It is. The movement, the cognitive movement version of the questions, which are the cognitive, which are the questioning method or move uh, version of the patterns. Right. So in this move, we're gonna we're we're gonna start with just the move names, and then we'll then we'll tell you what they are. So the move name for this one is called is is not list, and the move name for this one is called um, zoom in and zoom out. So that you can think of these as two different moves or one move, zoom in, zoom out. Yep. Uh, there's two moves in this. One is called part party. Because parts like to party. Because parts like to party. So there's always an exclamation point at the end. I like remind that flair you've added to that. <laughs> and then there's another one called barbell, which is like a, like a, you know, a relationship between two things looks kind of like a barbell. And, and we, we use a term called RDS, which we'll tell you what that means in a second. We call this an RDS barbell because it's a particular type of barbell. And then the name of this move is called P circle, which just means perspective circle, encircling something with a set of perspectives. So then when we think about the moves, we think about them as visuals or maps, little cognitive maps, which are critical. Why are they critical? Because we have more neurons hooked up to these eyeballs 
and these hands yes. than, than the rest of our body combined. Yes. Meaning your brain is more hooked up to these eyeballs and these hands than the whole rest of the body combined. Yeah. What it, it's actually not hooked up to the ear very relatively as much. Um, yet, you know, most of our educational system is kind of That's built right. on listening and we need to move more into object oriented stuff we can move around with our minds with our yeah, yeah. with our eyes and with our hands and that's why visual maps and stuff like blocks can be very helpful it's because fascinating it because, speaks to our brain you know we look when you and I have road trips we'll put a book on tape and you can listen to that book and you will remember that book and i struggle so mightily to connect to the book in an auditory version but if I had a pen and paper yeah. and I could take monkey bar kind of notes, yeah. I would remember it. But That's cool. we'll listen for hours to a book. We'll come, we'll be done. I don't know what. So I don't know what. <laughs> but you're an amazing reader, True. which I, you know, I have to like. This is why we work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, we're just going to show you the move visuals real quick. What we start with is whatever concept. Well, I always like to do like dog. Dog. Okay. So Dogs. we'll start with dog. Dog is the, you know, so we're going to put like a square or a rectangle here and we're going to do dog is, and then we're going to do dog is not. Mm -hmm. And then it's called an is, is not list because we're going to make a list of what it is and what it's not. Okay. Right. So we're just kind of doing parts of what it is and parts of what it's not. And, it, you know, so dog is furry, dog is, you know, pet, dog is yeah. lovable, dog is not a, you know, cat, cat dog is not a, a machine. It's not bald. And it's like well, a cerebral. Yeah, that are bald dogs, right? So this is where you're finding that boundary. We're an interesting bald, conversation bald. we're having now. Yeah. <laughs> so that is the move. It's a very simple thing to draw. It's very easy, but, but we need to do more of this. Right, but just... As a side note, you just drew a line here. And That's what I think is important is, remember, we're doing these two lists to get this boundary, to yeah. know what the dog is. Exactly. Right? Um, and remember, anything could replace dog. It could be peace. It could be... The initiative that we're working on. An initiative. On, or... It could be your water bottle. It could be whatever. Then we go into zoom in. Zoom in is simply you start with whatever and you break it down into parts. Right. So this could be, you know, galaxy and you could break the galaxy down into parts. You always would pick sciencey things. Oh. And I pick simple things. <laughs> like if you ask me the parts that well, I guess I could do parts of galaxy. Okay, so And then uh zoom out just means you start with galaxy, let's say, and you zoom out. So it's a part of this, which is a part of this, which is a part of this. And you know, you get to determine how many of these you want to zoom out. Sometimes you just need to zoom out once, mm -hmm. maybe twice, whatever. Right. And just, sometimes this galaxy could be part of numerous, you know, holes that you could think of. Right, right. But just to put it in another context, so if this was a project, project that yeah. project could be part of an initiative. That initiative could be part of a strategy, yep. right? And then that would be part of... Company. Then what we want to do is we want to take those parts and we, we're going to do a part party, which just means you relate the parts. You just, you just hypothesize. Parts want to party. They want to relate. They want to connect, right? And then it's helpful sometimes to name the parts. Name the relationships rather. So we're, you know, what is, how is this related? How is this related? How is this related? And that's part party. RDS barbell, we're going to take two things, which could be, you know, these two things or these two things. And we're going to take them off to the side and say, okay, how would we distinguish the relationship? So now we're using distinction to distinguish what is the name of this relationship? What's the identity of the relationship? And then we're going to use zoom in to zoom into the relationship. So we're going to see some parts. But instead of seeing the parts in this thing and that thing, we're seeing the parts in the relationship. Yes, meaning we're understanding. So it's often that we relate things, but we don't actually think about what yeah. that relationship is. Yeah. So when you take the step to name it, right? So if you think of... Um, you know, we done the mom and dad and the relationship could be marriage or the relationship could be divorce or it could be whatever. You know, to understand that thing, we need to name it and we need to break it down to its parts. Yep. 
right? And that's why we do that because we know we make relationships all the time, but we don't actually explicate right. them or articulate them. And then peace circle is just we're going to take something, anything like dog, and then we can think about what are the a circle of perspectives that we might want to look at dog through. For, so we could look at dog from the perspective of a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. We could look at dog from the perspective of another dog. And we could look at dog from the perspective of... Cost. Cost, sure. Right? And we just sort of see these as little eyeballs here. These are the points. And these are the views. And then you can break dog down into parts based on these different views. Yes. And so, these for example, points, rather. a vet's looking at a dog and what they see is a now or ear to yeah. third. And a dog's looking at their dog and they see their friend. Or friend or maybe. friend. Or, yeah. And cost is dogs are expensive. Expenses. <laughs> you see like food and vet. Yeah. Actually, that's interesting. The cost also involves the vet. So that that is what we call the patterns questions and moves table. Mm -hmm. It's a simple table that that really you're just kind of seeing the patterns from different points of view in a sense. You're just each column is a different way of seeing the patterns. They're the same things. These are just the names of the moves and these are the sort of visual representations of the moves. Now obviously as you get into it and we'll do more more advanced uh, stuff in future episodes but Right now, we're just learning these moves separately. Yes. But eventually, you'll start combining them, and that's yes. where things get crazy. And you'll combine them in the moment. Yeah, and you'll just do you it right. You'll just do it naturally, yeah. So that means if you're a visual thinker, maybe this is something that resonates for you. Yeah. Is remembering how these things are structured. If you're more question-oriented linguistic, maybe you start by learning the questions, and then eventually, you can do both. That's right. But I want to show you something. Oh, oh no! For people, that's and, uh, so much. That's a lot. Yeah, and we and you can practice these every day or every other day or just like you know, just like when you warm up at the gym. But let's take just one column for example, the moves, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say we want to practice the moves. Okay. Right. So we have we're gonna do the move maps, and then this is the patterns and elements, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And eventually what you want to do, I'm going to give you my watch. You can time me. Oh, I like this part. Yeah. So eventually you can do this very fast because we just took, I don't know how, how long this has gone, but 30, 40 minutes to talk about this. But I want to show you how fast it can really happen for you to get to the point where you're just so accustomed to it that you can just do it really, you can bang them out really quick. Okay. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Go. Stop. 32 seconds. 32 seconds. What that's doing is burning the neurons. First yeah. of all, you're, you're understand, you're remembering the language, mm -hmm. right? And you're burning the neurons on all these moves, right? 32 seconds. If you can afford 32 seconds, now in the beginning, it's not going to be that fast, but you practice to the point where you can, you, you just have them in your head. In order to draw these things, yeah. I have to have them in my head. Yes. I have to know them very quickly. Yeah. What this means is that when I'm up on the board and I got, you know, 10, 15, 20 executives in the room, I'm not worrying about remembering all these things and being able to draw them. I can listen to what 20 different people are saying and I can map it for yes. them, right? Right. But that's because I practiced. Yes. Right. So what I want to sh just show folks is, in the beginning, take it slow is smooth, smooth is fast. So don't try to go this fast. Slow yeah. is smooth, smooth is fast. The reason I can do burn it fast, memory, yeah, burn the muscle memory, burn the neurons, write it out, but eventually it'll be just da -da 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 -da. It's, and you just It's clicks. a lot like you were talking about with basketball. Yeah. You practice your dribble slow, you get good at it, then you start to get fast, then you start practicing a shot. 
and that's slower, and then you get faster and faster and faster. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. So you you know eventually eventually the only thing that's slowing me down is just moving my hand fast enough. But my brain could get, do it yeah. even faster. Well, the goal is that eventually it's all just happening all up just there anyway. It is, and it all is happening up there. It's just you don't you're not aware of it. So what this allows yeah. you to do is be so fast that you can keep up with your subconscious mind yes, that's and your conscious that mind, that yeah. you can keep up with it. Because it's you, the mistakes, the errors, the biases that we have that are making costly mistakes, that's all happening because the movie that is our mind is on fast forward. Yes. So we just don't see a lot of scenes. Yes. Now think if you could slow the movie down and you could see it all. That what this what this what DSRP allows you to do is stop watching life on fast forward, where you miss a bunch of scenes. Mm -hmm. Then you then it goes to play instead of fast forward or three x speed or whatever. It goes to play and you're like, oh, oh, this is a good scene. This is interesting. All these things are happening and I can notice all of them because my brain is able to keep up with all the things that are happening, all the information inputs. Yes. Yes. So it just allows you to be faster and keep up with what's already happening every day in every minute. Yeah, and it's faster, but also more aware. More, which is like the more accurate. Part. Yeah, I think that's probably a a good place to stop for today because it maybe feels like a lot, but remember, it's just a table, mm -hmm. and you're just doing the patterns and the elements. You're doing the questions, you're doing the move names, and then you're doing the move maps. And you can just start with the first column. Yep. And then add the second column. And then add the third column and the fourth column. And just and if you practice that, you, you know, within a week, you're, you'll have it. You'll have it mostly down. And just remember, make the analogy to anytime you're trying to learn a physical thing or a sport. Yeah. You start with the basics. You get a little better. You do this. You do that. And then before you know it, you're out there. Totally. Rock star. All right. That's a wrap. Thank you.